I think Asmongol is pretty fair about stuff, honestly. I, I know that's not really a popular opinion, but I think he's pretty fair, generally, in his analysis of things. Gaming journalism. I don't Where... agree with him on everything, but you shouldn't agree with everyone on everything. Where is it? And more importantly, why is it? Today, we're going to be answering those questions and figuring out why gaming journalism is what it is today. Yo, is that Vryn? There's been some yeah. other people asking this question, which are the people that work at the parent company of Kotaku. Oh, this is about Kotaku too. Okay. Because they realized that inevitably, I think they were losing money, losing brand value, or losing some combination of the two, and they have decided to completely flip the script on Kotaku, which is the uh, games journalism website that they own, and instead of Kotaku writers posting their hot takes on just different topics, mm -hmm. now these games journalists are going to be, unfortunately, having having to write articles about video games not just articles though games are, game game guides are different like if it was actually even actually no you could do 50 if you got paid full time if you were doing full dude you could definitely do 50 50 just like regular video game articles for sure you can for sure do that um I know because I did 25 a week and I was very part time. I, it only took me like an hour. So this has come to the uh, very an hour or two per day. Yeah, uh, big dismay of a lot of the people that work there. The editor in chief of Kotaku has resigned, along with I think a handful of other people. Now I don't necessarily think this is necessarily a win in all cases, but I do think for a lot of people it definitely is. And the truth is, I wanted to talk about why I think that's happening. Because I actually don't think that it's... Yo, he did the girl thing. He did... Guys, he did the girl thing. Look. And the truth is, I wanted to talk about why I think that's happening. Because... Like, where he, like, you fix your hair? Like, you're looking in the mirror? I actually don't think that it's entirely <laughs> something that has to do with Kotaku. I think that it's a problem, a meta-level problem, with number one, games journalism, and number two, text media in general online, and the way that people consume it. So I want to talk about... I see. So I see. So this is what you were talking about, Julio. ...why I think this is happening and where I think it's going to go. And I want to categorize kind of a lot of the concerns that I have into two different categories. You're going to have the first category, which are going to be things that are problems on a meta social level that exist beyond games journalism. And then you're also going to have problems that exist in the context mm -hmm. of games journalism and things that relate more directly to Kotaku specifically being affected in this specific way. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Kotaku things and the more specific reasons of why this version of games journalism is dying. And if you go, and by the way, I, I want to make sure that everybody, we're all on the same page here, okay? Open up Google, search for trends, look at all of the most popular gaming websites and, you know, the ones that write articles mm -hmm. and all this, and, you know, search, look at worldwide, set the trend from 2004 to now, which is the longest data segment that they have on Google Trends, and look at the popularity of these websites, because every fucking one of them goes... It goes all the way down. They're all dying. And well, I mean, the truth is, I mean, I don't know. How, I mean, how about you guys? When I look up a guide, there are two things. That, there are two things I look at when it comes to video games. Um, if I need information, uh, one is I look at YouTube, and two, I look at wikis. That's it. I don't actually go to like. I don't look up any fucking like long form website. It's either a wiki because the wiki is gonna have the, the direct data, right? So it's like I, I want to know like. How does this gun work? How much damage does the shotgun do, right? So I'll look at the wiki because the wiki will have the data. Like shotgun does this amount, shoots this amount of pellets. Each pellet does this much damage. This is the damage fall off. This is how many rounds you have. It has all that info in there, right? Um, how much penetration it has. All of that, all, all of that, you know, nerdy ass shit is going to be on a wiki and easily accessible. Uh, whereas if I want something more in depth, like a guide, I'm going to go look on YouTube. I'm going to, the first thing I'm going to do really is go on like YouTube, YouTube. And then I'm just going to type in like, I don't know, Hell Divers 2 shotgun guide, right? I'm, I'm this is immediately what I'm going to do. I do not go to Google and then type in to like, look for a website that has a random guy because half, like, I'm going to be real with you. Most of those are absolute shit. Those guides on like those, uh, 
those websites that are like written but they're they're, all, they're almost always like such trash and like sometimes they'll even bait you into thinking they're going to answer your question but they don't actually answer your question and it just makes you pissed off and this has happened to me like so many times that i just don't even look at those sites anymore like i i always either youtube uh it's either youtube or a wiki or very rarely if it's a very niche uh very niche issue um, I'll look at Reddit because Reddit's just a bunch of nerds posting. So it's like, it's one of the three. Um, I don't think, do any of you guys look at all of that stuff? Like, I don't look at, like, websites anymore for guides, like uh, the big news websites anymore. Taku does seem to be leading the charge there. And I think some of the reasons, obviously, is that... Reddit is double-edged for guides. Yes, that's why I said it was very specifically for, like, incredibly niche topics. Like... Uh, I will look at Reddit for things uh, such as um, uh, like the last time I looked at Reddit was like Hell Divers, Hell Divers crash, late game, 30 minutes extraction, like something like that. I would look up something like that to like try to find out like why my game is crashing to see if anyone else is having the same problem. Kotaku has had a lot of different people writing for the website over the years, and I think that with a lot of articles, this really kind of started to happen. The schism started to happen, I would say, in about 2014. This was like the advent of Gamergate. This is whenever people started distrusting games journalists, and in general, there became this adversarial relationship that was created between consumers of video games and... Well, that's because the, the games journalists are constantly, they're, they're fighting against the gamers. Uh, critics of video games or professional critics of video games, commentators of video games, people in the video game industry and in the professional video game media space. So whenever this happened, obviously, you know, whenever you tell gamers that they're irrelevant, well, guess what? They think the same thing about you. And so that's pretty much when a lot of these things went down which is really kind of an obvious thing that you could expect to have happen. Mm -hmm. You know, insult your audience and they're going to leave. Who could have imagined that? Yeah. So I think this is really one of the big problems is that obviously you have a website like Kotaku and the website is putting out 50 articles a day, let's say 100 articles a day, maybe let's say only 20 articles a day. And you hear something problematic about Kotaku maybe once every month right maybe somebody has a crazy take somebody says something stupid and this happens once a month maybe let's say twice a month think about how many articles get released and then think about what the ratio of omega fuck up articles there are it is a very very small percentage of articles but unfortunately for kotaku if you build a hundred bridges and you suck one dick you're not a bridge builder <laughs> true that's so true you're a dick sucker. That's true. And I'm going to tell you guys something. For the last 10 years, there's been a lot of people that could think <laughs> Kotaku sucks dick. And that's the reality. <laughs> so guess what happens? People are going to stop taking a website seriously. And they throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're not paying attention to the good articles. All they see is the bullshit. That's true. And then the next time Kotaku puts out an article about a new game that's well-researched, well-understood, and everything, well, guess what happens? People say, oh, well, it's Kotaku. Aren't they the ones that did X, Y, or Z? So there was like that. There was this one uh, website that did the same thing where uh, I, w I was looking at their info, and I was like, dude, this is bullshit, right? And like after that, like I never looked at it again. Uh, it was... Uh, ugh. I think it was like, I think it was like that Fextra Life place. Cause then like, I, they were the only ones that had like a wiki for, I think Baldur's Gate or something. So whenever you have a few uh, artists or writers, I guess you could say, and not really artists, but uh, writers on the- What do you mean? I'm hitting, I'm hitting the space bar. What are you talking about? Platform or, you know, bloggers in a lot of cases, let's be honest, uh, writing these opinion pieces about video games in order to garner clicks. Because really, if you go to the website, this is Kotaku, this is almost any of these websites. Uh, you know, I, I'm 20, uh, 20, haha, <laughs> very funny. Um, I was talking thinking about the year 2002, but uh, I'm 30, 33, okay? And so I remember back in the early 2000s. you know getting on my mom's computer before she woke up trying to look on porn websites and everything and i swear to fucking god guys there were porn websites in the year 2001 that had less pop-ups and more <laughs> ethical ads 
than a lot of these new gaming websites do right now. It is insane. I, like, I go up there, and I'm getting, like, four different pop-ups. They're trying to get my email. They're like, can we locate your address? What's your zip code? Holy fuck, yeah, for real. Zip code. Can we advertise this to you? Do you want DoorDash? Like, what is going on? It's insane. So it it's is 100% like accurate. Website and I'm concerned. It just, well, the, the problem, too, is it looks like shit. It's just, like, vomit, right? Like, I don't even want to look at it. That I'm going to get a virus somehow. And uh, honestly, you know, a virus would probably be the least of my concerns. So what ends up happening is that people obviously turn off ad block. But the reason for that is because the the website is... Dude, I'm not going to lie. Every time there's like a website that's like, that's like, um, you must turn off ad block to like look at her thing. Like, you know, you click here to disable ad block and then like, you, th then you can look at the site. I'm just like, fuck you. I just leave immediately. Thanks for the follow, Error and Kim. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just, I'm gone. It's plastered with ads. That's effectively what's happening. So what happens? Well, it's very simple. If you have a website that's plastered full of ads, you are no longer focusing on creating quality content. You are now focusing on creating content that generates a large audience. And the truth is that rage bait articles do that. Uh, there are a lot of people that are going to go to a platform. They're going to read the article. Oh, son of a bitch. I fuck. And then they're pissed off and then they leave. But at the end of the day, the person who wrote the article is still getting paid 25 cents for that or whatever. Yep. So that's effectively what happens. So. A lot of these websites are built off of the economy of rage bait. They're built off of the economy of hate. Because that's what sells. Like, rage and, like, clickbait and all that stuff, that's what, that's what does well. I'll just give you guys an example. I, I, I spent all this time making, like, this, uh, um, like, a review for a game. And uh, I spent time recording it, writing the script, doing the voiceover, uh, cleaning the whole thing up, uh, sh uh, you know, going back through, um, you know, stream footage, cutting up the stream footage in order to make a video. And, you know, it took me like a couple a couple hours to make that. I put it up on, on, on YouTube. Absolute dog water. And then um, freaking uh, producer Julio over there puts up a video that says, Dragon's Dogma homophobic? 10 times the amount of views, 10 times the amount of money. It's fucking bullshit, bro. It's bullshit. And I hate it. But like, what am I going to do? Clicks. And that's what ends up happening. And then those hate clicks uh, generate a negative, uh, I guess, like perception of the website. And like literally zero effort. Like he literally went, he literally went into the VOD, cut it out of the VOD, posted it up. Dragon dogma homophobic. And that negative perception bleeds over to other writers. Pay Julio? I do pay Julio. The fuck? There's another contributor. I just gave him a raise because he's so good. It's on the website and it effectively invalidates their hard work as well. I think there's probably most people at Kotaku are probably just video game enjoyers who want to write articles about video games, then they love video games. But there are a handful of people that effectively spoil the whole bunch for the uh, eyes of the gaming public at large. And I think obviously there are some people that like the website. Kotaku's had good articles before. I don't. Think well, yes, I I know I know Julio. I'm just I'm I'm paraphrasing. I'm just making it you know making a joke you know. Kotaku is always wrong or terrible or they deserve to go out of business or anything like this. To be totally honest, uh, I respect everybody's freedom of speech, especially the ones that I disagree with. Very unfortunately. Yeah, me too. So yes, uh, but again, I I do think that very clearly. This is what's happening, is that these people are being alienated, and then they no longer go to the website for anything, even though they've only been alienated by a handful of people. What's funny is Asmongold is like, yeah, I respect these, these people's freedom of speech, but I guarantee you if they had a death note, he'd be dead. Users. So, uh, basically, they're not wanting to go to the website. Website's credibility is damaged, and now nobody takes it seriously. Now, is moving over to making guides on the website actually going to work? Well, I think let's find out. I really can't see it going any worse than what they have now. So, really, I think they should try it out before they fire everybody. And somebody had the idea that 
you know, if they're telling the, the writers they have to make 50 guides a week on Kotaku now, and somebody says that, oh, well, they don't really think that. They just want to put out this, like, massively high expectation, so hopefully that they will demoralize the employees and make them quit, so they don't have to pay unemployment or any severance pay, which, you know, it's the parent company that's doing this. Oh, there's a part of me that believes that's probably true. So, yeah, I think that's another thing. It's not only that. It, it's, again, like I said, like the lawsuits, right? Big factor. And Pluto said I never use a death note. Yeah, me neither. And uh, the guide idea of like making content about that, I do think is good. I do think it's possible for Kotaku to redeem its reputation and its image. It will probably take five years, realistically, for that to happen. And every time that something bad happens, it's you know, you know, you can take the uh, you know take the boy out the hood, but you can't take the hood out the boy. People are going to be bringing that up with Kotaku every single time, right? It's the bridge builder and dick sucker thing all over it. <laughs> So I, I think it'll be very good. But it's true though. It's true what you guys said, chat. They, they it wasn't one dick. It was many dicks. Hard for them. And I can't really see a world where Kotaku exists in the capacity that it does now in let's say ten years from now. And so those are the reasons why I think Kotaku specifically are having problems. Now they, they I mean, like, yeah, it's either it's either it's either the ship sinks slowly or they they it's either yeah the, the the ship sinks slowly or they park it on land blow the ship up and then like build another one now i want to step back one step and let's talk about games journalism collectively and why i think it's having problems the reason why i think a lot of games journalism is having problems is simply because it's an outdated medium because a lot of yeah but you blow it up but you're on land right so you can like maybe have a chance of other youtubers are <laughs> moby dick <laughs> <laughs> Dick Bridges. They're able to be more agile. They're able to create the content in a way that, for example, here, let, let's do a little, little fucking uh, experiment here. Right now, gentlemen, if you are listening to this video and you are not watching it, tab over. Oh my God! What do you mean, gentlemen? There's women that watch too. You like my Kotaku writer impression? Was that pretty good? Were you guys convinced? Did I sound like a certified otaku? Uh, otaku, Kotaku writer. And comment that because I'm yeah, very, spot very on. curious. Right. There are a lot Good. of people who are passively consuming video content, even though it's me here on the camera. But who gives a shit about that? You are just simply listening to it on your second monitor while you're playing another video game. Or or working. Or maybe I'm working while I watch. And I think that's what happens with a lot of people. And with text media, you have to be an active consumer. But with video, dude, this is why I, I, I this is why I always do audiobooks. I don't read like like actual like dead tree books anymore, because like I can do other things while I read a audiobook. It's so good. Video media, you can be a passive consumer, and also video media, it's easier for it to get, keep your attention. I think this is especially true with video game media because video games are fundamentally a video experience, video game. So uh, writing text media, you are transitioning. Yeah, I mean, I know there's like a joke there. You, if you're listening to an audiobook, obviously, but like, it's like read a book, right? Sort of. It, it's eh, who, who cares really? Not medium into something else and of course there are going to be things that are lost in translation as with anything else so i think that's also a very big component to it is that the idea of an article or like a review written by a game reviewer uh, I, I think that you're going to have just a much lower bar of quality there whenever you compare that to somebody who is reviewing games on YouTube and they only have to pay themselves, maybe an editor and maybe two other people at max in a lot of these cases. So you, you have an overhead of four people. You have almost, you have no business space. You have no, you think about like Kotaku, each writer probably has a boss who has a boss who has a boss who has a boss. Uh -huh. And guess what? All of those people are getting paid. So that means that you have to plaster, again, more ads. You have to diminish the user experience. And also, very importantly, whenever you look at it from the perspective of a writer, you have to decrease the quality of your work because you need to make money and you need to meet quotas. 
So when it's yeah. happening, and this is what happens, how many of you guys have had this happen at a job, is your job creates some sort of quantitative assessment measure. I worked at the government, and so I know about this. You did what? Fucking glowy. He's a fed. It all makes sense now. Asbin's a fed. This. Uh, how many of you guys have had a quantitative assessment measure that gamified your job? Well, I think that a lot of people have had this experience. And guess what happens whenever you turn your job into a, uh, you know, basically video game? You go like the you speed run that shit. You know what I mean? You go like maximum farm. You put the rice hat on. You go maximum farm, and you just you do it like in the fastest way possible. Well, people start playing. This is why people call you a chud, by the way. What is like like what is the okay? I I, I know what it stands for now, but what does it have to do with any? I, I don't I don't get it. Game instead of doing their job. And whenever you have... Is, has that been around for a long time? Because I swear I've never heard that before. A reward structure that is created around putting out content as fast as possible. You have a reviewer who's supposed to go through 10 games a week. Three years? Dude, that's like... That's brand new, man. And they're trying to look and make sure that they have all the information for it. They're either massively overworking themselves to an unhealthy degree... Or they are putting out content that is uh, incomplete or inaccurate or not fully baked as much as it should be. I think a really great example of a lot of these reviews is New World. I remember whenever New World came out and everybody was giving it glowing reviews and then all the screenshots that were being shown. Apparently it does. In New World were all screenshots of uh, the level 20 zones. I think that's a problem. You know, you have a massive long form game and all the people that are reviewing it have put. So, OK, so what does it mean? Like what is OK? I, I understand what it stands for, but what does it mean? Like, what does it mean? Like, what's the actual like when you what are you insinuating when you call someone that? Stupid. Okay, okay. Leaders reclaimed by four. Oh, it's a 4chan thing, I say. I, I have seen that on 4chan. U ugly, stupid. A conservative Republican, someone who is either racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, Xenophobic, fascist, bootlicker, or all the... Oh, yeah, I mean, I could see why they call me that. They think I'm all those things, so yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Don't agree with me politically? So it's specifically Republicans? I'm actually an independent. Did you know that? 10 hours into it max and this is a game that's supposed to be i kind of sometimes i kind of wish i was so i could i could vote certain people out of the fucking office because they're stupid as hell played on a very regular basis and i think that for any of you guys that are so you actually can't vote in like primaries if you're not like actually like a part of a political party and sometimes i wish i was because some of these people are freaking absolutely stupid you know, been very deep into a game and you've, you know, played through the entire... But here's the good thing, though, is that when you're an independent, they all they all kiss your ass, dude. They all kiss your ass and I just love messing with them, dude. It's, like, the best. Like, like they, they send you text messages. Like, they'll be like, hi, 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 miss. Like, like would you love to, you know, this... I, I used to get these a lot, dude. Like, these people are against your reproductive rights can I count on your support? And then I usually just I do that. I, I fuck with them, dude. I just like, I, I write to them. And I start, I just start talking about conspiracy theories and I just ask them like, like, uh, uh, <laughs> I think one time I, 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 I said, I said, I said, oh, is that true? I, that really scares me. But I need to know something first before I vote for you. I need to know like, what is your stance on Ligma? 
Skywalker thing, let's say, and you look at, for example, a Final Fantasy 16 review. And what is your stance on the li the upcoming Ligma e e epidemic? I would just mess with them constantly. And all of the screenshots are from Garuda, which is like the first boss in the game. And I I, I think one of, one time, hold on, wait, dude, let's see if I can find it. Oh, let me check on my check my fucking phone, dude. I always mess with them every time they send me a message. Mm. It's gonna be hard to find. But the last person I was um I I think. I think I, I think I, I asked, I, I think I, I asked them like, what's, uh, I think I asked them like, what's their stance on Mongolian basket weaving? It's like, well, what's the rest of the game? The well, Mongolian you know, basket really weaving community. Like what, 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 what is their stance? So what is their stance on, on the, uh, the effects that COVID has on that community? It's like, oh yeah, let's give this a great glowing review whenever we haven't even done the entire thing. And I think that's what ends up happening. So you have a profit monetization structure that incentivizes shoddy work and bad work. And I think also what really makes this even worse is the second component that I was talking about, the first component really, uh, that I was talking about previously, which is how bad articles and bad content ends up getting more clicks and more views. So it creates a feedback loop of creating things that are offensive or problematic to get views instead of things that are uplifting or useful to create views. So you write a really bad review, everybody reads the review to see how bad it is, and you're making a lot of money. Oh my god, I need to make more bad reviews. And I don't think that anybody really goes into it like that, but at the same time, whenever you have a reward structure, you do create a feedback loop one way or another. So I think that's another big component of why games journalism is uh, not as popular as it used to be. And a great question and a great frame of reference to think about this from is when was the last time that an article was relevant and important enough for the gaming community to be talking about it in a metric other than outrage? <laughs> I was about to say, I was about to say like, yeah, I was like, wait, what are you, what are you talking about? And he says, other than outrage, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> True. I can't imagine it, right? I mean, I, I think Jason Schreier wrote a few articles recently that were pretty good. He wrote like the there's like a Blizzard one back whenever the whole scandal happened. And there were a handful other ones too that were pretty good. He's probably Ironically, like when people want to read like written content, it's usually on, on X nowadays, right? X and there was like another one. Uh what's it called? Substack is that the one? Reddit, yeah, Reddit. Probably the main guy I would think of, but besides that, I mean, fuck, who are we really talking about here? So I think that this is also again, there's the component of competency that is cre that is effectively invalidated because of the frequency that you need to work at in order to produce a living wage from this type of work. And then you also have the other component to this, which is the fact that I think a lot of the writing in these gaming journalism websites in general, and I think this is true also with all media, but I don't, I, I kind of want to use it in the second concentric circle before we get that big. Uh, but I mm -hmm. think especially with games journalism, you don't really have a lot of like active voice that's really seen whenever you're writing something, you're reading something that was written by a certain person. Uh, I do believe that written media is actually the most pure form of communication of ideas that there is. And I actually view this entire deterioration as a bad thing. I think that written media, like there are a lot of times you guys know probably, mm. uh, you've probably read a few of my twit longers that I've written about different things. And I actually genuinely enjoy doing that because uh, writing things down and having them constructed like verbally and in a literal way actually gives me a way to organize it in my mind to where I can think about it in those paragraphs that I create. Oh, and I see. I think mm -hmm. that really, like, you're talking about me here, you're thinking about me, what I'm saying, but whenever there are just words on the page, I think that the words on the page convey an idea in a much more pure way, and there is less noise. Yeah.
you, you also have um like a lot of the stuff that you would write write down in like an essay for instance for instance like it, it feels awkward like reading it you know what i mean like with a camera on you it just it it feels a lot weirder than just like releasing it as pure text in that message that's being sent however and this might sound a little bit contradictory but i believe that it's true also the truest greatest like media and and writing is the writing that you can tell who wrote it without reading the author's name and i think that having a certain voice that you're able to use inside of the media that you write and inside of the things that you say and it's like for example man that's kind of hard i don't even know if like um uh... Uh, it's probably because like I haven't really like read things um I haven't really had to read things like that I mean I do read on Twitter like I I read like when people post threads on Twitter about certain certain topics I'm interested in but again like even with with books right like I could use an audio book instead so it's like the amount of like actual reading I've done is a lot less than it used to be. I think the last thing I really read was like um it's things that the things I usually read nowadays are things I can't get in audiobook. Here's a really good one for anybody who's in the streaming community. No, I can read pretty fast actually. I can read pretty fast, but the problem is is when you read, your attention is one hundred percent all your attention is 100% on the reading. You can't do anything else. Uh, like, for instance, doing something that is uh, just a waste of time, like driving, right? Uh, unless you're driving for fun, like you're going racing or you're going on, like, a joyride, um, driving is a waste of time in terms of, like, you do you do nothing during the period that you're driving. So, like, listening to an audiobook actually stacks... It stacks with driving, and it gives you, uh, like, double double the farm. Does that make sense? You can you can farm while AFK while driving basically. An XQC tweet. We all know what it is. You all see it. You don't even need to know who it's from. You just see a massive block of text that's caps lock. Well, it could also be Donald Trump, to be fair, from back in the day. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's basically a good example of that, right? Where you're writing something in a voice that creates a personality that people know that it's you, but at the same time... Bro's life maxing away? I mean, you should. If you're just driving, like, it's always a good idea to read, like, uh, to, to read an audiobook. I mean, it's it's... You know, you could you could be also listening to a podcast, things that kind of give you more information about the world or invest in yourself because you can read you can read like a book that gives you more skills, um, you know, through. Uh, through. You know, while you're driving, which is just something that you normally would just not really be doing anything. So it's just 100 percent worth it. Um, the only exception is. um if you're working. So for instance, my job requires me to think about things constantly and to also uh, think about creative things because, uh, you know, I'm working on games like game designer and uh, working on like stories. So like when I drive, sometimes I will intentionally not listen to an audiobook or a podcast. Sometimes I will listen to music, like specifically like uh, instrumental music or uh, anime openings. Um, depends on what I'm writing. Um, if I'm right, if I'm going to be writing like an action scene, I'll usually listen to anime opening musics, like one piece openings or something like that. Shonen anime openings. I'll usually listen to those. If I'm going to write like an action scene or if I have to like design like a fight, um, in a, in a, uh, for, for like the tabletop game, I have to, de I have to design like a boss encounter or something. I'll listen to something like that. But if I'm writing something more like, emotional more like world building i'll listen to like uh I'll, I'll listen specifically to um either music i don't understand or uh instrumentals that that's conveyed in a literary way, way. and i think that being able to do that is and, and knowing like to the degree of doing it right because like there are some things that need to be more dry and some things that need to be a little bit more played up and exciting. 
So whenever you have something that's being written. No one loves Turbo says question leaflet. When did life become this bulletin board of time efficiency on everything we do? I feel like most things we do on a day to day basis that isn't tied to our jobs or basic human management doesn't need to be micromanaged me personally. Well, it's not about not enjoying like the small things in life. Like for instance, if you do enjoy driving, then sometimes it's good to just drive, you know? Sometimes it's good to just get out and just see the scenery of like what you're driving out. But it depends what you want out of it, right? Like if you're not actually doing that and you're just like literally like just like, sometimes you do things for entertainment, right? Because it's important to also take in content and take in entertainment. So in, in, in some cases, I'll just listen to like a, like a, you know, mu you know, whatever music, uh, I feel like, or I'll listen to, um, like those story podcasts. I'll listen to something like that. It, it depends on the purpose of what you're doing, but there should always be a purpose behind it. You know what I mean? Even if that purpose is to just relax and enjoy the scenery. You should be aware of that. You should be aware that that's what you're doing. Does, does, that, does that make sense? It doesn't mean you always have to do something. So you should be aware of why you're doing it. And you have to write 10 articles a week. In 10, you, you exactly. You don't really have time to really think about how can I insert my voice into this? How can I dial up the rhetoric of this to make it more compelling and interesting to listen to? How can I think about the readability of these paragraphs and how it flows together? Uh, you know, am I reading this out aloud? Am I thinking about this? Like, you know, you're not thinking about effectively the psychology in which that you're creating the information that these words are, uh, you know, meant to convey. And I think this is a roundabout way of saying that the writing quality is just kind of low. And I think that it's low, obviously, because there are a lot of people that are just really not very good writers. And then there's also another really big factor, which is, I think, equal, if not a larger factor, is that the profit margins and the profit, uh, you know, win the incentive condition here is, is quantity, not, not quality. yes, exactly. And so guess what happens? What the happens? incentive is for it to, is for you to be, uh, What's it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's basically quantity over quality. You have a lot of quantity and you don't have a lot of quality. That's just life. And so uh, that's another very big reason why I think games journalism is uh, being uh, kind of made irrelevant, is that the popularity of YouTube videos that are able to just release something that's way more comprehensive and deeper with a much lower barrier to entry, with a much more targeted audience, because, you know, it's like if you watch... Um, skill up. If you watch Force Gaming, if you watch Mortismal Gaming, if you watch, well, if you watch me, if you watch Moist Critical, you know the person, Dunky, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Mudahar. You know the person who you're reading that article from or you're watching that video from, and people who resonate and who agree with them in terms of their viewpoints of games, they find that content creator and they look for the person that has the same type of preferences that they do. And whenever you have a large scale website for that, you don't have that ability for a content creator to have that, a writer to have like that special audience that they can write for. I don't think I have ever remembered a specific game journalist ever. Now that I think about it, there's never like, like there are, there are, you know, content creators that like I know, but I don't think I've ever specifically known a person as a games journalist like for their written work like not for the drama like obviously like you're gonna know people for the drama but for and know that they're making content for those people explicitly in the same way that youtubers can so that's also another big reason is that it's easier to dial in on what you really want and with a large-scale website like kotaku it's harder to do that so that's basically mm -hmm. the other point, right? This is things with games journalism. So I think, again, massive overhead, being outdated by YouTubers, low uh, you know, quality articles that are incentivized by ad clicks. That's another really big problem that's affecting all news media, or sorry, all video game news media. So now we're- I think it is all news media, actually. Here, which is the reason why I think text media in general is declining. I think that we all know, obviously, that newspapers aren't as popular as they used to be. Yeah. And mm -hmm. people are consuming text media now, but oftentimes it's in the form of- Is it weird though? I kind of like how they smell. They smell really good. Thumbnails, tweets, or 
some other variation of very very short form text that is less than or at least more not newspapers more than a paragraph so what ends up happening is that you have obviously like you know how much information can you really convey in a paragraph and people don't really care about reading as much because again it is an active activity whereas watching a video or listening to a video is a you can't you can't min max it that's why you can't min max it you can't read an article while you're cooking you can't read an article while you're driving um it that's why passive activity that you can do while you're doing another activity at the same time which again creates an advantage for video like what's content. really the difference what's 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 really i guess the only the only difference is that it's coming through your own mind rather than the person saying it that's the only real difference is this in your voice rather than theirs someone else's so i think that's also another very big reason but in general i'm going to be honest i think that we have a literacy problem I think that in general, and I, I don't even know if it is truly literacy or it is just literacy laziness. People just simply don't like reading as much. I, I mean, okay, I don't know if this is like, again, applies to everyone. It's not that I don't like reading. Again, it's that it's inefficient use of time. That's why I don't read, usually. It has nothing to do with like... um has nothing to do with uh, reading versus listening. It, it's it's just the efficient use of time. I can I can cook, I can drive while I'm listening to something rather than having to actually look at it. You know what I mean? And I find this to be a very big problem. This is not a good thing, but I do think that it's- Yeah, I fall asleep when I read too. Definitely happening. But I also fall asleep listening to video essays. So it's the same thing. And I also think that just in a general sense, and I think this has been exacerbated by things like COVID, for example, it's probably the biggest example I have, uh, is that there has been a growing distrust towards any sort of authoritative media at all. So whenever you see like a big website that has an opinion, people are like, oh, okay, will this BlackRock own this or does George Soros own <laughs> He's not wrong. He's not wrong. It's like, it's like, wait a minute. What did this website say? Did they say something kind of woke? Okay, who owns this place? It, I mean, it's literally what's going on with like Sweet Baby right now, right? Like, wait, this this thing, Pokemon, Sweet Baby, right? Like, where's the Sweet Baby? Like, let me let me find out. Let me find out if if Sweet Baby is in there. <laughs> like, it's so true, though, man. It's so true. This right or Rupert Murdoch on this. So everybody is thinking that they can see the man behind the machine and their seven different layers of skepticism are on full activation mode. I, I mean, the, the thing is, though, I mean, like, is it really wrong? Is it really wrong, though? They're actually, I mean... Are there not people putting their money into very specific, like, initiatives to sway the way people think? Do you think that's not real? Like, there definitely is. There definitely is money being put into things that, that sway people's thoughts in certain directions. And they're not trusting anything. That yeah, and they openly them. talk about it. What well, Draco said, yeah, they brag about that shit. Dang. Now, by the way, I think this is an incredibly good thing, and I wish that, I think that for a lot of people, they, exer they exercise two different degrees of skepticism. Their skepticism for things that they agree with is like, oh, is it, yeah, you said somebody else said that? Yeah, of course they did, everybody knows this is true. But, you know, if it's something you disagree with, it's like, okay, source? Okay, how many people are in the sample size? Who was sampled? Okay, where was the wrong? Were sampled? Okay, so you're looking for healthy people, but it's in a college? Well, of course it's going to be young people. Yeah, invalid study. I don't believe that at all. It's not true. <laughs> oh, God. He's spot on with that one. No, that's fake. And so people are very, very, very not sorry wrong. about the things that they disagree with, and they often get taken advantage by the things that they agree with that are still misrepresented in a way that's manipulative. So I think that's another very big problem, but that's a problem for another video.
The point is that there has been a growing distrust of mainstream media and media in general, and this also includes YouTubers, but to a lesser extent because people don't view them in the same way as a conglomerate like uh, Kotaku of multiple people and, you know, a news outlet in general. And, you know, this you want to know something weird is, um, Aspen has a lot of money. Right, he has a lot of money, but yet, like, when he streams and makes videos like this, like, the camera isn't, like, ultra nice, like, ultra crisp. The lighting is, like, mega scuffed, but, like, I like it. There's something about it that I like, like, the scuffed, like, blurry, like, not ultra crisp, like, expensive fucking camera and then the the really really scuffed like ghetto lighting like i i like it i like it this is anything from fox yeah it's fucking it's not even fucking centered <laughs> like it's yeah it's like tilted to the side cnn down to kotaku or ign and people of course have the same viewpoints about alternative media except for alternative media is much more overt with what their biases are yeah and, yeah it makes me so, yeah you're right you're right fiji it's like it's like reminds me of good times you know i think that you have a uh, literacy problem uh, whether this is actual literacy ability or literacy laziness i heard but people i heard kids can't read nowadays i heard a lot of kids can't read now does it really matter i think the same effect is going to happen so you've got that factor as well. And then you also have the other very, very large issue that I just think that people don't really give a shit that much about what these what the articles are about. Like this is this is something that's been happening with I would say everything. Like I read all of these articles and it seems like nobody is engaging with them. Nobody cares as much anymore. And I think also there has been a level of emotional elevation that all rhetoric and all conversations on the internet have. And I think that a really great uh, temperature check for this would be if you look at a lot of the YouTube thumbnails of, you know, I wonder who. Uh, think about all of the YouTube. See, I, I forced my nephew to read. Well, the problem is, and I mean, I, I hate to sound mega boomer, but there wasn't like 20 and there wasn't like god 20 i wish it's not even 20. there's not like 40 anime a season before before you you, you didn't have 40 anime you didn't have like 10 different streaming services to like consume content you didn't have youtube infinite like infinite youtube content to consume so it was kind of like you had like movies and then you had like a couple of video games and then you had like maybe like whatever showing on TV. That's, you know, it, you know, it's not like like everything's on demand. Um, and then you had books and books were like the most books had the most variety. Right. So like before there was like only like a couple animes like per season. So if you really wanted like your fix outside of that, like you, and you wanted to find something very specific, you'd have to read books because then there are tons of books, so many books, um, compared like compared to the amount of um, of easily because the thing is, is books are harder to digest again for the reasons I said earlier. They're harder to digest than you know videos or uh, videos or um, audio right so youtube thumbnails and faces that different people and youtubers make and how the more expressive faces and the more yeah your 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 attention is in more of demand nowadays there's so many Haley things that you Flitt. could point your attention I to hope you're doing thanks well. to Stone. thank you so I much thank you for this like 20 channels on tv and a library card for entertainment oh man how many people even still have a library card Damn, I remember having a library card. Did you guys remember like having to? Oh, oh my god, dude, this is this is gonna date me so hard. How many of you guys remember like going to the library and then you had to like learn how to use this fucking decimal system and then like you had to like open up a drawer full of fucking cards? Like you couldn't just like go on the computer and be like books about aliens. 
you'd have to like fucking look it up in like a thing and there'd be like a little drawer that you pull out and there's little index cards they have like all the all the books and you have to like look in it and it's so annoying man it was so annoying like i mean i don't know i mean i don't know if it's because i i grew up in a small town so to be fair i grew up like kind of in like the not really the countryside but like pretty close the edge of the countryside so it was kind of like that and like i remember like going to the library and i like even like even as a kid i would like like my interests were like oh i want to know about about cryptids and fucking aliens i i, I, I was a freak i don't know i don't know to tell you uh, i would i i was weird i was like that 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 weird girl that was like into like aliens and ghosts and that's all i would look at and i would um go to the library and you'd have to like open up like a drawer you'd have to find out like the section for like the like paranormal stuff and then you'd have to like look it up by author it was such a such a pain and then you could only check out like two books at a time damn attention and more click through track leafla are you the girl in watamote my mom has compared me to her uh, it was kind of a pain because when Watamote came out, I watched it with my mom and my brother, and they made fun of me the entire time. Like, I would not hear the end of it. Traffic. There's a reason why so many content creators do the exact same thing. It's because it works. So whenever you have a highly elevated uh, culture of people that are looking for extreme viewpoints and opinions, text media isn't as good at transmitting highly emotional uh, viewpoints that are very contentious in that way in the same way that let's say a video like this is for example or a live stream is so you have people that are gravitating towards more emotionally driven media and I think that text media again one of the beautiful and great things about text media but also an Achilles heel in the taste society is the fact that a lot of people simply are not interested in the facts they are not simply interested in reading information about something they want to read a headline they want to get mad about it and if the headline turns out that it was wrong well then somehow they find a way to rationalize it after the fact i'm not really like that like i actually like to understand like what's like i, I like to understand like the meat of the pro of the problem but maybe most people are like this i don't know i can't i can't you know i can only speak for myself right so we have all of these problems coming together to create what I think is a perfect storm for the effective, uh, you know, arm. I am a documentary the, enjoyer, uh, though. The the Ragnarok of these uh, different gaming websites, and I do think that some of them will survive, and I think that some of them are changing their business model in a tremendous way. A uh, good example of this is IGN. IGN has been releasing a lot more videos, and these are videos that maybe are just reposts of trailers. Oh yeah, well, didn't IGN release like those? Uh, was it IGN that was releasing those like gun videos? IGN guns of oh, there is it? Is it IGN? You're like IGN's videos have been pretty good. What? The haven't they been? Let me look. Hell Divers Guns IRL. Was it GameSpot? Oh, it's GameSpot. Yeah, ga it's GameSpot. Sorry, it's GameSpot. But the like, GameSpot's TV really good. I'm really liking like GameSpot videos. Looks, and they're also even publishing opinion pieces that people have in video form on YouTube. And I think that in doing so, they are trying to create that newer audience and make money in a way that's more uh, relevant to today's society. And I think that's really what's going to be happening for a lot of them. And as with anything, uh, as millions of years, right, uh, adapt or die, evolve or die. They released an article uh, about how Resident Evil 5 can't be remade. Wait, is that the one that, like, it can't be remade because it's racist? Is that the one I'm thinking of, Age? That the Resident Evil 5 can't be remade because it's racist. Because you shoot, you, all you do is shoot black people. Yeah, what a, what a fucking stupid article. That article was dumb as fuck. It evolves, nor the most intelligent. What a what a dumb piece of shit article. It's the one that is most adaptive to. That's so stupid. It's like it's like yeah, you're gonna shoot black people because it takes place in Africa. 
Are you fucking stupid? Like, what the hell? Changed, as a quote from Charles Darwin, the guy who discovered evolution. And, like, by the way, heads up, we've been shooting white people in all of the other Resident Evils. Evolution. God so damn. what? It's still true. And it's true even as... Dude, these people are so obsessed with race. They're so obsessed. They think about it all the fucking time. That's all they think about. Is like, what color your skin is. That's all they think about. Holy fuck. Well, in a symbolic sense like this. So you're going to be seeing a lot of these gaming websites falling apart and uh, probably losing at least what little relevance that they have. There's a certain point where it's no longer worth it to publish these articles and to have such a large staff on hand in order to create this type of content. And uh, there's a lot of people that are saying good riddance, and I understand why you say that. I respect that. That's totally okay. But Dude. Dude, someone should mod that. Someone should mod that fat just as a point of like how freaking ridiculous that would be. They should do it. They should just keep all the clothes the same and like the entire scenery the same. They should just they should just race swap all the models out. And you know what? Change all of the women into men as well. Might as well go all in, right? Right, there's no women in there. There's none, zero. All of the zombies, all the zombies are, are white men. All of them. Also, no gay zombies. <laughs> no gay zombies, okay, guys? But I do think it's definitely a- That zombie has a rainbow shirt? How fucking dare you? Sweet thing, because as I said, I think text media Commit. has a great place in society. I think it's extremely useful, <laughs> and it's great at conveying a true message and an idea. Not feelings, not people, and not, you know, oh, this is what it was, but an actual idea. And you're thinking about it internally in your own head and not consuming it as an external uh, stimulus. And so that's, that's my viewpoint. That's why I think that, you know, gaming media is falling apart. I think that, again, there's these three different concentric circles. Text media is just falling apart in general. I see this with newspapers. It's very, very common with newspapers. And uh, I think it's becoming common everywhere. It's just gaming media is simply one it's just, example it's of that. Just the times changing. So yeah, guys, I wanted to make this video, talk a little bit about this topic. I have some opinions about it I wanted to share. And I'd be curious to hear kind of what you guys think about it. Do you still read any gaming news articles? Do you care about them? Are you happy that they're going out of business? You know, what do you think? And uh, that's basically about all I've got. But yeah, I've wanted to talk about this at more of a length for a while. So I really hope you guys enjoyed the video, and uh, I'll talk to you in the next one. Peace. It's pretty pretty good video. I'll 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 link you guys to it. I actually really like Asmund Gold stuff. It's very um I think he's pretty fair about a lot of things. I'm not saying he's right all the time, but he's he's fair at least. I don't I don't really feel like he's bullshitting either 